question is, um, how do you think we can uh, spread the message more about 9-11, that sort of thing? And because it's becoming um, quite a, you know, crucial point now um, <clears throat> to get people sort of woken up to, you know, what's going on and that sort of thing. So have you got any ideas for sort of waking people up, I suppose? Well, I mean, as far as 9-11 goes, it doesn't actually take very much to tell people that there's something wrong with the official story. Uh, and all it needs is a few chinks. What I've found is that you need um, just a, a few little sort of facts and present them with very obvious things that they can see for themselves, like the one that really kicked off the doubt in 9-11 was how do you get a 757 through a hole that's effectively 20 feet across at its you know, main entry point? Anybody can understand that. They can at least see, oh yes, hang on, there is a debate to be had here. Uh, and it doesn't really take too long for people to come on from that to question lots of other aspects I think the only way to really get them to seriously look at it is to present them with evidence. And before YouTube really kicked off, like three or four years ago, I mean, now everybody instantly goes to YouTube on the internet, but before that, there was a, a major network of DVD swapping. You know, Loose Change 2, the, the, which was the one that really went big. I mean, there were so many people that were just copying Loose Change, leaving it on trains, giving them out at meetings or whatever. And that was a big moment. Um, that certainly got the ball rolling into the collective. And now there are lots and lots of presentations about 9-11 available on the internet. If you can just make people aware of them, those that already feel deeply unsettled inside themselves, they can't put the finger on it, but they know there's something not right about 9-11. They only need to sit for 15 minutes even just to get the key stuff um, give them some links, say to people, well, watch this, look at this, or read this. Give them one book by David Ray Griffin, and that one book will be enough, because his logic is so impeccable. At the end of the day, <clears throat> they need awareness that there is an issue, and they need the evidence presented to them, which can then you know, very quickly convey to them that there, there is another side to the story. I don't know of any other way of doing it, but I think at the last poll, a bit similar to the whole global warming thing, the last poll in America, something like 60% of people now doubt the official story of 9-11. Um, that's the collective in action, and that's a massive thing, which has, again, not received the coverage that it deserves. So there is hope. Um, considering that um, so many people are um, not really buying the party line anymore and they are getting sick of things and they, they really know that there's something wrong and that something needs to change. Do you think that there is a scope for a group of people getting together and putting up a genuine alternative um, for general election at, um, in the UK? Uh, I think that's an excellent question because um, it's not, it, it's not a, 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 a matter of getting across specific stories about 9-11 or global warming or whatever you're worried about. It's the kind of world that we actually want. And it's very important not to forget that in the, mi in the middle of complaining about you know, conspiracies and and uh, lack of uh, freedom and being controlled and everything. We've got to get out of being controlled and then we say, well, what do we actually want? And that's much more important in my view than um, you know, just getting the stories out. I think there's a very good point there. Um, and one thing, I, I, yeah, I would add to that is this thing of, <clears throat> you know, this is the old cliche, but there's a truth to it be the change you want to see. And the one thing, and I agree with this, fear is the problem. Yeah. That what's happened is the population are in such fear of terrorism, 
climate change, swine flu, whatever it may be, that they're frozen into inactivity. And I think, yeah, there needs to be almost a body of people encouraging people to step out of fear and not be paranoid either. I know that particularly in the conspiracy world that there's a lot of feeling that, oh, you know, they're out to get us. I think we have to throw that off because that's giving in to the very fear that this elite would seem to want. So we mustn't live like that. I think we have to live sort of brightly and live in a way that we think is how it should be and try and share that with as many people around us as we can. And it does have a knock-on domino effect, whereas fear also has a knock-on domino effect. Um, <clears throat> in terms of answering the direct question, wherever the gentleman's gone, um, should there be a sort of body of people putting themselves up for election and that... Possibly, um, whether or not that it could ever get anywhere because the system is so closed against people like us, I don't know. But what you have to do is set up like an alternative community that is as active, that is as meaningful as the official one. And I'm because he bar there uh, nodding. I was going to say people like Hamish over there, wave Hamish, wave <coughs> has set up the parallel community. Uh, which is trying to set up branches around the country of people who share our concerns, who want to live differently and create a sense of community spirit. So do go and speak to Hamish later because he is somebody who's actively setting precisely uh, what you mentioned into motion. And yes, I think we need far more things like that. Um, maybe I could just add also, just from a medical perspective, that um, as of possibly about eight years ago, if you were to ask people how many alternative practitioners there were compared to GPs, you'd be surprised to know there were about 40,000 practitioners and 36,000 GPs. So actually more alternative practitioners than general practitioners. And, uh, but obviously the presentation you get from the media is that, of course, that the mainstream is dominant and that's the, the, the larger voice, especially with regards to medicine, and it actually isn't the way. So in a similar sense, it's the thing to do is to create the alternative because it's okay to bash the, what's going on, but until people have a viable alternative, they're going to carry on doing what they're going to do. And so the real push is, let's just do something different, and um, we'll see where that goes. Okay. I wonder if you could make any comments about the uh, proposals to introduce uh, Internet 2 and uh, plans, uh, therefore, to restrict access to um, various websites. And uh, I mean, the Internet is, is, uh, <coughs> very, is so important to all of us uh, as, as we are all trying to disregard the mainstream media. Um, what can we what can we do to protect uh, the access we have to the yeah, internet? Okay, we'll That's the first question. The other one is uh, to Trevor. Um, could you just just talk us through um, whether um, vaccinations are compulsory for our children, and is there any way around it? Uh, um, could you talk us through sort of waivers, and um, uh, can we just basically avoid vaccinations if we want to? Okay, we take the first point first. Uh, yes, Internet 2, I mean, it's not officially called that, but it's been dubbed Internet 2, is basically a scheme whereby the Internet that we know today will be much more heavily regulated. And it's been proposed um, that what should occur is that a website is effectively these days, because multimedia has blurred the, the boundaries, <clears throat> that a website should be treated just the same as a television channel. And the argument being put forward by those, excuse me, <clears throat> who think that um, you know we should not have a free voice, are saying, well, if you had a TV channel, you would need to go through the regulators, you would need to go through Ofcom, you would need licensing. Why should a website be any different now that people are putting YouTube clips up, you know, film or whatever? So what's been proposed is that you will have to get a license to run your website. Now, instantly, that creates the problem that, number one, of course, if you're putting out views which are considered a little bit extreme, you may not get your license, or at the very least, you will probably have to pay to go through various checks and that. Well, most small people, the kind of people that have set up the truth websites, are not going to have those kinds of resources available to them. So they will be instantly shut out of the market. The ones that will thrive will be the big kind of companies, you know, inevitably the big corporate forces. Uh, and the other thing, that what they call Internet 2, will be a much faster system. But the only way you could be on that system is to be one of the licensed, regulated websites. Thereby, without ever having to ban anything, they've managed to wipe out a lot of the counterculture that's come through from the Internet. 
It could do. Uh, well, the other problem is that, and I believe this has been pioneered in Canada, the other way they could regulate the net, which has also been put forward, is that when you have your sort of package of you know, broadband or whatever, it will give you access to certain websites, a bit like a Sky pan a package today, that you will choose this one, this one, and this one. If you want to surf onto another website that isn't one of those, you will pay a much higher premium for doing so, which of course means most people won't. They will stick to the same websites, and it means you won't have this lovely culture of linking to things that you didn't expect to find and finding information that you didn't expect. <clears throat> so that's the problem and given that one, I can't remember who it was, one of the neoconservatives in America recently expressed the view that truth websites, and particularly talking about 9-11 truth websites, he said that they foster terrorism. Why? Because they are effectively questioning whether or not Muslims were responsible for 9-11. Therefore, we are fostering terrorism. That is the kind of warped thinking <coughs> that they are using to shut down the internet and we need to be absolutely clear to keep this debate alive, make people aware that this kind of thing could happen, and campaigns sooner or later are going to be needed to be mounted to keep the internet this wonderful window of free speech that we have had. Yeah, I think it will be fatal for the Institute of Science and Society. Uh, by the way, our magazine is not even in W.H. Smith because we cannot afford to pay the money to get there. Um, so uh, that would certainly be a bad idea, and we have actually been blamed for 9-11, by the way. So <laughs> yes, myself, Vandana Shiva, who some of you might have heard of, she's been helping uh, the Indian farmers a lot in India, uh, fighting genetic engineering and, and uh, globalization and everything. And uh, a, a lot of us ha have been branded, like, like you say, you know, 9-11 terrorists. Uh, so I'll move to the question of the vaccine issue. Um, no, the vaccines aren't compulsory, so of course you can, as Hillary Clinton says in her drugs policy, just say no. So um, it's as easy as that. However, of course, the issue is, isn't that people, I don't believe that the, the issue is that people will make you do these things, but they all present a picture of disease where you think you kind of have to. And that's the bigger problem for me, is that without information, it's easy to convince people to do X and Y. Um, and that's basically through propaganda. So the short answer is no, they haven't. Although, you know, with the swine flu vaccine, as the vaccines are being developed, I mean, the latest two being cervical cancer and swine flu vaccine, what it's showing, lots of people are actually starting to see through the cover. So for example, with swine flu vaccine, 49% of GPs didn't, wouldn't take the vaccine. Now that's unheard of from you know, the people that are providing your health policy that don't go along with the health policy. So as time's progressing, it's as though the drug companies are getting slightly desperate with their asset sweating, as it were. They need to make money and the pipeline's looking kind of dimmer and dimmer. So they're resorting to these crazy techniques of dreaming up um, diseases and things and DNA profiles of viruses and so on. And uh, trying to convince people they have to have these vaccines, otherwise they're gonna die. So the the issue is you have to be convinced that you're going to die. The issue is you have to be very afraid. Once that's in place, then people willingly go to the slaughter, as it were. Um, so it's and so far it's as easy as that. In the States, I think in Massachusetts, people may have heard that on the statute books there, I don't know if it was signed off, but they were putting in some legislation whereby you could be forced to be vaccinated. But you see, as they got closer to the day where they were gonna sign that off, people just kind of rose up in arms. Journalists were saying this is complete lunacy. So I, I just feel that, and even over here, various commentaries have said that um, if we did that, actually you would get more resistance. And if you got more resistance, you'd get more airtime regarding the alternative. So I, I think actually it's, we're a long way from that. I don't think they would do it. My question, it was a medical question again, actually, um, and about genetics and diseases. Um, my girlfriend's actually got diabetes and her dad's got diabetes and she actually had breast cancer last year um, and both her grandparents had breast cancer and uh, when I went to the hospital with her in the Christie's the first thing they asked is you any history of cancer in your uh, family but since I've been into all this alternative I've been watching stuff on the internet and Lorraine Day and Bruce Lipton in America 
And they seem to suggest in it's all to do with the environment and what's happening around you, what's going into your mind, what you're eating. Um, and even they suggest in it's not genetics, but there's more chance of you getting it because you your parents, because their, their lifestyle is sort of like transferring to how you sort of live your life. So just really about that, really. Yeah, um, I don't know if you were here when I spoke about genetics yesterday, and uh, the, all the evidence appeared to suggest that environmental influences can actually modify your genes or mark your genes so that it predisposes you to certain d diseases, and then it can actually be passed on. And of course, in the case of diabetes, it has long been recognized that diet has a large component. And in fact, uh, <laughs> I know of um, a, a, a diet that has been um, very effective in tackling diabetes, and I don't know if you have heard of it, it's macrobiotic diet. Uh, and let me just say this, that even if it is in your genes, it doesn't mean that you are condemned to suffer it. There are lots of things, environmental effects through you know, uh, diet and other interventions that can actually help. So you, know, it, it, you should get away from the, from the kind of uh, fatalistic feeling that if it is in your genes, then it's bound to happen. You see, again, this is another aspect where they like you to feel helpless, and now you're in the hands of whoever is taking care of you, you know, like your doctor or the uh, mainstream medical establishment. Wow, so there's, um, there, there are a number of issues there that you've raised with that issue of genetics. Um, and you talked about Bruce Lipton, and I think that Bruce Lipton is a great character to read, and if anybody ever heard of him or want to hear about him, in terms of changing the paradigm. Um, okay, so there's several things. One, if I have, if I am genetically predisposed to something, does that mean anything? And how free am I within that genetic predisposition? And how it's looking, especially with regards to cancer, is although the genes give you the blueprint, you certainly have a. There are lots and lots and lots of things that you can do that will completely move move away that predisposition towards cancer. So that's the first issue. Um, but and yes, of course, if people have certain predispositions as parents, they will pass some of those on to their children. And of course, there's advantages to that because we can learn from our parents through molecular uh, traits, as it were. And um, so that's one issue. The second issue is that the idea, what I was talking about yesterday, in a very simple perspective, was that if you, for example, ate a poison, your body would then react by vomiting, and that's actually quite a clever thing to do. One of the things that we need to understand is that pathology actually has a very clever reasoning behind it. So, and that's a big switch for most people. I and mean, how the hell can diabetes be intelligent? Was actually, if we think about type 2 diabetes, just to indulge myself a little bit here, and what your, what your body's basically doing is, look, I've had enough sugar, you keep feeding me this high GI stuff, and I'll produce this insulin, and I'm going to keep absorbing it in my cells, and at some time, point your body's going to say, I don't want any more of this stuff, so I'm going to become insulin resistant. And that's a very clever thing to do. But of course, you're, the medical professional will basically say, everything your body does that isn't normal is pathological, and you've got to stop it. So there are two issues. On the one hand, you can do a lot to change, to, uh, change your genes and change the expression of your genes. And the other thing, you need to see how your body is intelligent in its expression of pathology. If you did those two things, you, you completely move yourself away from the medical paradigm, and there's an awful lot you can do that you're not a victim of. Basically, yeah. My first one, I come into contact with a lot of people, and I'm wondering with the Codex Elementarius, if there's anything about people being controlled regarding uh, the running of allotments and controlling soil and being forced to use pesticides within allotments. Does anybody know about that? <coughs> Actually, Codex doesn't control you so long as you don't sell anything. You know, one way, one very good way of getting around it is to ask people to subscribe um, to some list or something in which you can actually then uh, exchange. For example, I give you the, the um, um, what is Henry, Henry Doubleday Foundation. 
they've got lots of organic seeds. And they've got a membership in which people will actually buy some seeds from them or write them for some seeds, I forgot. I think they charge a very small amount. And then they get sent these organic seeds that are not on the National Seed Register, for example. So anybody wanting to overcome that can use that scheme. And um, in fact, the Codex Alimentarius, I know lots of friends who have been there fighting it. And I have to say that, um, in fact, you know, not labeling it as a drug, you know, is a very easy thing to do. So you don't really need to abide by their uh, conventions in any case. And in fact, I if you look, go to your local health food store, that's essentially how you pick up your supplements if you need to. But having said that, I have to say that there is no substitute for good food. Good, fresh, organic food grown locally and eaten fresh. And I think that's what we should go for. And then, when you need it, food supplements is, is, is something that we should be free to get. I must admit, legally I don't know a great deal about the Codex in terms of its um, details, but May is right in that, for example, you can sell echinacea, May 1, sorry, May 1 is right, in that if you, you can sell echinacea, but you'd have a job selling it as an antiviral or a, a flu remedy. So as soon as you start to label it as being able to do something, then you get into that legislative process. Um, but of course they are trying to do things like reduce the amount of vitamin C you can have in a tablet and so on. So that, you know, there are ways in which they can make things fairly, as ineffective as, as they possibly can. But other than that, I'm not clear about how it affects. In a way, we're going to change the paradigm. We might as well not use their stupid language. You see, because their diseases are all based on molecular nuts and bolts. And it's not, a w it's not a good way of tackling diseases in any case. So I think maybe it, this is an opportunity to take it as an opportunity to get out of that, that whole, the whole uh, outmoded paradigm. Can I just say, if you are concerned about the Codex Alimentarius, of course, uh, Ian's got some presentations about it available uh, through AV, but also look up uh, Scott Tips, who spoke at the last AV, and also Robert Verkirk of the Alliance for Natural Health. If you go to any of those sites, you'll find a lot of information about yeah, the very good work that is being done to campaign against these changes. So. Sorry, I've got another quick one, apart, apart from it won't be a quick one. Um, uh, I have in my family, one of my family members, um, uh, the shame of it all, works for kind of GlaxoSmithKline and the likes of, I know it's terrible, the embarrassment, the black sheep. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I feel it my responsibility to whatever e emails I get in, I flood to everybody, I put them on MySpace and everything. And when I sent them to the member of my family, it was absolutely shocking the... Um, the uh, suppositions uh, and the prejudice that came out. Because she was saying, well, what research have these people got? How, what do the, just because you read a few books doesn't mean you know anything. And the, the level of ignorance about what you people do and the level that you have. So my question is, have you actually, do you have like a list, and you might, might have covered this yesterday, about you know, research, solid research that, that I can give out. Web, I, know, I know the uh, Natural Alliance, but any other websites or information where people that assume that, uh, you know, as foil-wearing nutters um, are actually well-informed, massive of experience. I mean, I was telling her about, you know, John Braithwaite's book, The Corruption in the Pharmaceutical Industry. And it's like, well, of course they're going to write books like that because, you know, you're just a load of nutters that don't know what you're talking about. But there's factual stuff. So have you got anything that you can kind of direct and link people to? I'm sorry, uh, 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 another Edward. <laughs> On behalf of the Institute of Science and Society, ISIS, um, all our articles are fully referenced. However, you know, because of space, we don't print it in the magazines. But if you are a member, uh, and it's very, very cheap to get on online membership for 20 pounds a year, you can have access to fully reference um, articles. And they are based on the scientific literature. It's so all our articles are very well referenced. 
and um, they have been, s and we have, uh, by the way, we have submitted about, uh, about a half a dozen articles on flu vaccines to Sir Liam Donaldson and also the US FDA and CDC. And, um, y and we have been very active in preventing them from making the vaccine mandatory because that's the, the thing that we really don't want. Uh, this idea, yeah, can, can we have the references, can we have the details, can we, can we let these people know that we aren't tin foil wearing nutters? Um, there's an interesting book called um, The Myth of the Mousetrap, and basically it talks about how people adopt a new paradigm. And they go through certain stages, and the first stage when you present something new to people is it's deleted as spam, it's, it just doesn't fit in with anything. No, so they don't really care who I am, whether I'm a professor or not, or this, that, and the other. And, it, and it, you're not going to get to the point where you can give them references. Um, and then she goes through, Anne Rant, who wrote this book, uh, goes through various um, uh, stages. And the second stage is, um, I think, kind of interest, but there's fear associated with it. So they're kind of interested in what you've got to say, but they're a little bit afraid of the implications of what will happen to their own profession and their own belief system. And then the third, they get into an issue of, okay, I want to learn a bit more about this. And then the fourth, they get into trying to integrate, how are we going to make this part of my life? And so you know, the alternative view for people that are not ready to hear it will just be dismissed. And so it's, I'm not at all surprised that um, when people hear something that they're not ready for, that they will just not want to hear about it. And so it doesn't kind of matter what the, what the backup is or the references. You probably find that your member of the family will not be interested at all. And they need to, they need to just kind of back up their own belief system and their position. So, um, but you know, aside from that, we've all got websites and things like, for example, the thing that I want to promote is this Soma Wisdom, it's like the body wisdom. And all of that is basically in mainstream science. It's just not being collated as such. So the, the easiest thing in the world is to back it up, but that is not our issue, I think. Really, I'm, I'm very concerned about the regulation of herbal medicines and homeopathy as well, which comes into your department, and I've been campaigning in a particular area quite volubly. Uh, one thing we've been up against is that there's a lot of misinformation put about false dangers. There's loads and loads of books being written about any herbal medicine is dangerous, got to be banned, got to be regulated, conflict with drugs, MHRA reports, sage in your sage and onion stuffing is absolutely lethal, don't have chamomile tea, you'll die. But no, so go and get your jab for something against it right now. Um, but one thing, w there is a major desire by many therapists to be recognized and they think if they get regulated, they'll get reg they will get recognized two different things um, to try and get in health service or whatever. It's a complete myth. But there is this move to bring alternative medicines more to the forefront. But when we do so, we come into this very trap. The moment we want to be, hey, we've got the good stuff. Oh, in that case, we better regulate you instead. And in come the regulations and in come the controls and they then try and regulate you out of existence in the name of safety. And I'm a, I've, cover, I've been doing a lot of campaigning in this area. I'm, I'm a professional uh, a hemorrhoid in the backside of government and um, yeah. proud of it. Um, I've got a stack of government letters like this at home. Um, but I don't, I've, I've come to a point here and as I know, there are the, one of the organizations for homeopaths are now trying to claim that home homeopathy is so potentially dangerous. I'm not quite sure how that one works, um, but it has got to be statutory regulated so it can come under the regulation of the Health Professionals Council, which of course in turn is heavily infested by the MHRA, which of course is hand in glove with the pharmaceutical companies, and there's a government, a uh, House of Lords report, I think in 2005, stating that, and they are how the MHRA are in basically against alternative therapies on an official House of Lords report, and we're stuck on this, and I don't know a way forward. Any suggestions, please? Can I just very quickly say one thing, before, is that you raise an interesting point. One thing I meant to say in my presentation was, uh, if you look at the stats from America from a couple of years ago, they collated, and this is an astonishing figure. 
on average, 180,000 people die every year in America alone due to misdiagnosis, side effects of conventional medicine or something to do with normal medicine. 180,000 a year. I don't think they can demonstrate that a single person has died definitively as a result of using natural health techniques. And yet, why is it that there is no concern over the official medical profession? And it's all aimed at us. So yeah, I think this, it raises a very good point. previous decade, in this country, 80,000 people had died from etiogenic disease, you know, side effects of their drugs, uh, and the further 466 million pounds had been spent on treating the survivors of the side effects of allopathic medicine. And they are trying to regulate alternative therapies on the same basis as that rubbish by their rules that simply don't apply. And um, we're really up against this one now, and I'm trying to find a way through this particular barrier. But it's yeah. guys like this that's making the difference. It is. So thank you so much. But if those kinds of figures, those kinds of death figures, were for anything else, can you imagine it would be a national scandal, and yet we have to accept it for official medicine? We, it is actually the biggest killer. Iatrogenic diseases is the biggest killer in the United States ahead of heart disease or cancers or anything like that. Yeah, I think that was a report by Gary Null that is just, if you think of the underreporting, then it's probably even bigger than that. But the question was, um, how do we get around the regulation? And it's obviously a real issue, and it's something that is quite close to my heart, being a homeopath, and, um, and obviously having the biochemistry hat on as well. The problem is exactly as you say, is that um, on the one hand, I mean, obviously it's a big threat, and it's a major threat to the, the medical profession as it is now, and, um, and they're seeing that. And because it's a threat, then you're going to find these reports saying how dangerous it, is, dangerous it is and so on. And if it wasn't a threat, it would be just ignored. And it's not being ignored. Which on some level, then we have to congratulate ourselves in some ways, saying that we are creating an alternative. So, um, and I think, you know, and regardless of what I say in the next five seconds, basically I don't think they stand a chance. Because people are voting with their feet, they're just going to go and do this other stuff. But in light of that, what, will, what could possibly happen is that, as you say, they're going to say, well, okay, we can't stop them, because they have been trying to stop homeopathy becoming a, a profession, as it were, for a long, long time, and, um, and it hasn't worked, and people are, are, uh, are developing colleges and practitioners, and they have busy practices and so on. Um, so that isn't working, so what they're going to do now is try and regulate it, as you say. And one of the ways of regulating is um, to say, you have to learn our stuff. So you can be a homeopath, but you have to learn our medicine. And that way, you can have the same kind of restrictions of us. So not just regulating the remedies, but the practitioners, what they have to know and what they have to learn. And in doing that, they can kind of slide you, as they appear to be doing in Germany, as a kind of alternative style doctor, this is what, what I see happening, so that eventually you actually don't understand your homeopathy because you've been taught so much medicine. And I think it's probably the next thing that might happen is they say, well, actually, because you're our kind of people, you can prescribe antibiotics as well. And before you know it, we're doing those little things as the, as the get-out clauses because we've got diabetes. We don't really understand what diabetes is because we're interpreting illnesses from their perspective. So we might be able to give insulin now and then and all kinds of other drugs and so on. So the danger is that we get swam swallowed into the paradigm, as Maywan is saying. And so th the key is to just not accept that paradigm and just, I, don't, I mean, legally, I, I don't know what the answer is, but to stand with what it is that we want to stand for. And so if you want to regulate us, come in our ballpark. We're not going to come into your ballpark. If you want to recognize us, recognize us for what, what we do and how we're different, but we're not going to get shoved into your uh, particular area of expertise, as it were. So um, I don't know if that's answered the question for you, but I, I, under, I understand it's a real, real issue. Yeah. Yeah, stay, stay in your area. Don't try and become a doctor. Just stay in your area of, of, what, you, of what you actually do and what you understand by what you do. And, and then they'll try and regulate. And what they actually find is actually very, very difficult to. I mean, ever since I started homeopathy, which was in 1987, they've, they've been saying that we're going to have statutory regulation next year and next year. And this has been going on for 20 odd years, and there's still no closer to it. I'm a nutritional therapist, so I try and keep up with all the latest health issues as best I can. And I do get sent some extraordinary emails from various people. Two-part question, and I'll keep it quick. 
Uh, somebody sent me a link saying that they thought that uh, swine flu vaccinations were targeting specific blood groups and that the, the groups A, B and O uh, were likely to be very sick, that something was built in, but A, B would be very safe. So that's one thing. Um, I've just got an open mind to, because A, B is a slightly different group. Um, so that the vaccine was targeted to certain blood groups with the ABO is, typing? Is there any truth in that? Uh, well, I don't know if there's truth or not, but I've, <laughs> not, I've not heard about it. No, okay. I don't know about that. Yeah, and, uh, the most, um, the, there have been uh, reports that it has been created intentionally in the laboratory. And uh, I don't know if that's true. Certainly, it has a, a lot of it characteristics in this swine flu virus that doesn't really look as, it, as if it has been naturally evolved. Now, one believable hypothesis is that it was, it originated at least partially from a very dirty um, vaccine that was given to pigs because, you know, all the labs have these different strains and it's very unusual for them not to detect this virus arising because they have these surveillance procedures and uh, it's impossible to miss it. So it's, it's a very suspicious uh, swine flu and I definitely think that um, intensive agriculture, uh, sort of intensive livestock uh, industry has uh, made a contribution as well. Um, but I haven't heard of that, uh, that it is targeting particular blood groups. Although I should point out, um, at the previous AV, AV2, of course, Leonard Horowitz spoke, uh, and he spoke at length that in his view, the, the, the swine flu vaccine is basically designed to wipe us out through a series of stages of activating pathogens and that. I have no idea whether that's true or not, because I'm not qualified to say that, but I'm sure you can order uh, the presentations from AV2, and you may be interested in, yeah, Leonard Horowitz. Thank you. Now, my local PCT is absolutely desperate to get hold of a bit of my DNA. I keep getting questionnaires, please tick these boxes, please send blood samples, please send poo samples. It's uh, over 50s research or a, a, any excuse, women's research, whatever. Should I be more scared of giving my DNA sample or should I be less scared of giving my DNA sample because I Don't will be Don't give your DNA. Thank you. Don't, That's what I want to know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know they're trying to say that, that it, it's good for you, but it's not. Thank you. <laughs> good top of the morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dex. I'm Irish. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'll try to be brief. It's not easy for an Irishman, okay? Uh, my name is... Let go, yeah. You can let go, darling. I think I'm all right. <laughs> she, she doesn't want to let go of you. Oh, okay, okay. In case I say something wrong. All right. No. I would just like your thoughts on my little story about personal health stuff. And I'll try not to exaggerate. <laughs> okay. I was in France 10 years ago, living in France. And uh, I suddenly couldn't walk, I had bad pain, legs, everything. And went to the doctor, had an x-ray. They said I got severe arthritis. I asked them if it was anything to do with my lifestyle, drink and smoke, and I'm generally horning around, you know. Okay. <laughs> He, he said, no, it's your father's fault. <laughs> Honest, that's what he said. He says, please don't pay her. You know, it's to do with your dad. I thought, what, him again? Anyway, he said, no, you've inherited this. You've got no cartilage in your hips. Um, you, you need new hips, okay. Um, they gave me anti-inflammatoires, <laughs> anti-inflation something. I could drink a bottle of whiskey and I was okay, but one aspirin, I'm on the ground, okay? <laughs> That's life. One aspirin, I'm down there. I, I've always been like that. They gave me anti-inflammatoires, and I took them like Smarties because they told me they would help. And then I vomited blood because I got three bleeding ulcers in my stomach. And that was worse than anything. Okay. I'm such a hero. Listen. <laughs> 
Anyway, I'm shaking. Or is it you? Okay, it's me. Right. I'm sorry, I'm doing my best to be really cool and inside, you know, I'm going mad and my mouth's gone dry, but bear with me. I'm spitting feathers. Okay. So, where was I before I interrupted myself? I think he ought to be up here, really. Yeah, <laughs> down here. I'm vom okay, I'm vomiting blood. Ian, uh, next okay. time. Okay, so they said to me, wait, you can't take any of these. We found a new drug. This is the miracle drug for you. It's called Vioxx, V-I-O-X-X. -X. Oh and this won't hurt your stomach, and it'll kill the pain. And I took it. I thought, great. Then anyway, I was watching CNN. I'm in France, remember. And I saw there was men dropping dead because they were taking <laughs> this. And they were getting $250 million, the wife was. My wife wouldn't get that for me, I'll tell you. She'd take 10 bob. <laughs> now, <laughs> I said to the doctor, listen, I saw on television <laughs> that people are sort of... Look, she said, every medication has... Les effets secondaires non sueti, that means undesirable side effects. I said, yeah, but these side effects seem to be terminal, <laughs> you know. So I said, look, are you sure about this? She said, well, I've heard nothing, just keep taking it. I stopped taking it. Anyway, that's basically what happened to me. Um, I stopped taking the Vioxx, and uh, it's made by Merck's three miles about where I live across the Swiss border. I have heard they kept producing it, knowing it was costing, it was killing people. This is what I heard, I don't know. But the, count the accountant said, look, we're making more money than we're having to pay out, so let's keep it going. Have, have you actually heard of, of this and can offer some information about it? Can you <coughs> give me anything on the upside? Yeah, well, actually, we, we have uh, an article written by Professor Peter Saunders on it in our magazine. Uh, the, um, the the company is being sued, and um, maybe if Peter is here, maybe he can actually tell us the. Where is Peter? Peter, yes. can you can you just tell us the? Irish, so my definition is different. I'll speak to you later. What happened was Merck was eventually sued in the American courts. They settled out of court for about oh, it was about two billion dollars. The point of that was that they never accepted responsibility. People tried to sue them in this country. The government originally said they'd help, but they didn't. They don't provide legal aid, with the result that nothing much more has happened here. They're currently being sued in Australia in a proper class action. This one is going on. I don't know the result yet. I don't think it's out. The one interesting thing that you'll all be pleased to know is that the lawyer representing Merrick in Australia said that they weren't responsible because he said a pharmaceutical company has no duty of care to the people who take their drugs, which sorts of sums it up. Hi everyone, welcome to the stage, Greg as well. This question is also probably going to be centered a, a, a lot around what you're, you've got to say, but obviously relevant to everyone else. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say I think the only true force in the universe is love, and that's it. But I also believe, I also believe in tough love as well. And a lot of people speak to me about revolution and an uprising of some sort, and, I, and they go, oh, you can't fix a previous problem with the same uh, level of thinking as it, the thing like that, but it's a big difference between offense and defense. And I see the powers that be with vaccination, with the media, with the suppression of medical knowledge and also robotization. That's a massive offense against the people. And whether we take a small example of, say, 25,000 African children dying per day, the, the mass rape of culture through the corporate-controlled matrix, or the coming vaccine epidemic, which is going to just treat everyone like a non-sovereign cattle in the livestock management program. These are all great reasons to have an, an uprising. And I would like to say to you guys two things, two parts. At what stage do you think the dissemination of information amongst ourselves is not sufficient anymore, and that we actually do need to come together as a people and fight for our right to be sovereign human beings? And also the, um, the second part to my question, um, is um, do you feel that by disseminating this information, and we're allowed to do this, I can actually stand here on video and say I want to bring down the British government through a violent uprising and get away with it. Um, it's, I have great free speech in this country, but we're allowed to say this. Uh, what stage? We'll edit that bit out. <laughs> Censored by AV3. Anyway, uh, 
Uh, what, uh, do you feel that maybe disseminating this information around the world, and we've got the big movies on the internet, 50 million people have seen them, every single person in America, 83% of the population, no JFK was killed. Do you think there's an element of what we do that is an inoculation of information into the thing? Because maybe if we were suppressed a bit more, we would have the coming revolution and kick these bastards out of power a bit sooner. Okay, thank Great. you. The problem I see that even when you have a group meeting like this, um, people get motivated, but then at the end of the day, I think we're focusing 90% on the actual problem and 10% on the actual solution. And it's fine to actually go, you know, 9-11 was an inside job, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's microchipping agenda on the horizon. The, the solution is putting in preventative legislation, let's say for our side of things, which is focusing 90% on the solution rather than just the problem. Um, I think also with truth movements, there's a lot of ego regardless. Um, everyone's driving their own agenda and it has to be said. Um, and for it to actually move to the next stage, um, there has to be a total drop of ego and cohesion for, for the common goal. And it then becomes a case of if that fails, well, then you have to basically go, look, I've tried everything I can. I've, I've got the information out there. And then you reduce it down to your family and the people closest to you. And then ultimately, it's you, you're the only one who's responsible for your free will. So ultimately, if the whole system crumbles, the only thing you have and the only thing that you're responsible for is your own decision. So. What I'm saying is it's a, it's a two-part approach. Like, everyone needs to help humanity and you need to get this information out there. But we also have to be realistic that we're dealing with the inherent la lazy nature of man, where people do get motivated, but there's very, peop very few people that will then follow through um, with action. A and that's where my um, gripe is with, you know, all these... Um, nothing against Ian or like, but all the events, it's like across, across the globe. Um, it's, it's a case of let's spend 90% on the actual solution. And we know there's a problem, but let's just flip the game. Okay, uh, I think that last point is extremely important and I emphasize it again. You see, the Institute of Science and Society is not a think tank. It's actually, our motto is sign in, science in action, in and for society. So that's how we operate. We try to be quite active and proactive, and you're quite right. One of it is to get good uh, legislation. Although, again, there, you are already you know, buying into the system because you think that they will make good laws for you. But that's uh, another, another issue. So, it, it, it might be that we have to set up our own local communities that work. That is the good way to start, is to start local, up out of the system, have local currencies, barter, everything, get out of this stupid financial system that it, it's the tail that's wagging the dog. There's a lot of things wrong with it. And there, you know, that's how we should start. So a bit of action, you know, just showing people that it could be done. It's already being done. There are lots of local communities getting into action over this. And, you know, they will practice this kind of alternative medical, um, I would call, I'd like to call it organic medicine because it covers a whole wide range. And we mustn't be dogmatic. We mustn't be narrow. We mustn't have our own little agenda so being organic is being flexible so we should be as inclusive as as possible and start local that's my message well i agree with everything that's been said there um i would add to that if you want to start really local you've got to start so locally you've got to start with yourself and i think one of the crucial things is that we need to look at how we are being because how we are affects all the people around us, has a domino effect on our family, those we work with. Um, if we are seen to be living a new truth, 
if we are seen to be not only voicing concerns, but seen to be trying to proactively deal with them positively, and as you say, solutions. Others then are encouraged by that, and this is what I sense. When people realize, oh, maybe there is hope, maybe I won't be ridiculed for sharing this, it, they begin to open up too. So this change that we're all looking for has to begin here, local, community, and then, as Greg was saying there, it really, really does. And like I said to you earlier on, if we come out of this weekend and then just go straight back to normal, not making any difference in our lives, you may as well not bother, or it's like going to see a movie, you know. Yeah, nice weekend, but that's all there was to it. It must mean more than that. And, and this is where it has to start. Yeah, um, I think, obviously, I agree with all that stuff as well. And um, just going to the point of these kinds of events, I mean, part of the issue is that we're all coming with our own individual stuff. There may be people here that have not heard of issues of vaccines, of chipping and genetics and the media presentations and so on. So we're gonna, we are going to have a bent towards saying, look, this is what the problem is, even though actually we spend most of our life not dealing with the problem, actually trying to create creative solutions to get around that issue. So it is a slightly warped uh, presentation that we're doing to you because we're, we're basically giving you a story that you may not have heard. You may not know that there are this and that and the other problems going on with vaccines in the medical profession. So the presentation is a slightly warped sense of what we do with our lives. And, um, and in that way, there may be you know, a couple of approaches to this at least. But my big thing is to create an alternative. The reason that alternative medicine exists is because people are out there doing it and they're not part of the system. And that means that the government will start to get involved because they're looking at people and saying, listen, they're doing all that stuff. We might have to get involved with them. And maybe we could do it that way around as well as putting the pressure on government. So I don't think there's one way forward. There are lots of ways. Everybody's got their own avenue. People are more at au fait with uh, government policy and pushing that way. Other people are more at creating um, movements and getting people that way. So every which way we can do it, everybody has their role to play. And as Greg says, there's no ego here. If we can all add to the same thing, we're going to get there in the end. Brilliant. Let's give a big hand to Trevor Garden, Andy Thomas, Dr. May Wanho, and Greg Nicoletis. <laughs>